Hello everyone, this is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I want to tell you about a new podcast out called Fouls Count Anywhere. It is a classic pro wrestling podcast that brings you the legends of wrestling with true wrestling fans Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. They bring on guests that are legends in this business as well as wrestlers of today, promoters, referees, you name it, they have them on there, folks. And I encourage you to listen to them. If you're on YouTube, watch them. They drop every Saturday. They have their podcast. They drop it in the afternoon. So look forward to that podcast coming out. Falls Count Anywhere podcast with Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. Folks, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee it. And enjoy the podcast. Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm Brian Ferguson. My guest today is considered one of the greatest ring announcers in pro wrestling, if not the greatest, in my opinion. He has worked in many territories and promotions and is best known for his time in the AWA, WCW, and the WWF. He has also written a book titled Body Slams, Memoirs of a Wrestling Pitch Band. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Gary Michael Capetta. Gary, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I thanks for uh, inviting me. You know, I remember you as a as a as a kid. We were talking a little bit before we went went live or recording here, and I remember you mainly in the AWA when I was a kid. Uh, WWF later, obviously, and WCW. You did do some territorial work. Um, of those places you have been, what was one of your favorite, either promotions, territory, whatever you want to call it, that you that you really enjoyed working in? Hmm. There, there are favorites for different reasons. Um, okay. I couldn't just uh, give you one, but when I was with WWF, WWF, which is now WWE, I was with them for 11 years. So they were exciting years because they were my first years. Okay. So the first, uh, for instance, Meadowlands or Philadelphia Spectrum, where there were 20,000 in attendance, that was exciting for that period of time. Mm -hmm. And then when I left there and I went with uh, Fern Gagne, uh, we did the first pro wrestling show on ESPN. So that mm -hmm. was the first national audience um, that was exciting for that reason. Yeah. And then WCW was the first time that I was full-time in any wrestling promotion, traveling, um, you know, as much as 250 days a year, doing their weekly TV, their uh, live specials, and then their house shows, their non-televised house shows. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I was probably the first full-time ring announcer. Like, that's what I did. I didn't work in, in the office in any way. Um, I have a lot of firsts, you know, like historically. Yeah. Um, and then I did backstage interviewing with Ring of Honor, and that was exciting because that was um, very innovative, mm. a very innovative product compared to the big three that I had worked with previously. So there were exciting times at different parts of my um 50 years for different reasons yeah. wow i i still remember you um in the 80s when you worked in the uh, awa under Vern Gagne. Mm -hmm. that's where i really saw you first uh what was it like working for Vern? uh i hear different things you know good bad or indifferent yeah. um I've heard different things too, um, but just my personal experience, um, my experiences were all positive. Um, he was maybe a little distant from current trends at the time, but other than that, he, he always treated me well. He, um, he always delivered on what he promised. Um, he was, 
he was um, also interested in you as a as a as a person. He thought of you. Um, just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, he brought me out to Minneapolis to do uh, Wrestle Rock at the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome. So that was where his offices were. And he had his secretary call me the next morning, knowing that my flight wasn't until late in the afternoon, wanting to know what I was doing that day. And so I didn't have to wait at the airport. He sent a car for me and brought me to his offices so he could show me his video, um, his TV suite. And, uh, and that was, I saw I hung out with him and Greg and uh, I think it was Larry Zabisco. So it was, you know, he thought of you in yeah. that, that way. Yeah. Um, and to me, that says, that says a lot. So I, I yeah. have only positive things to say about them. Well, that's good. Uh, you know, like I said, you hear different things. Two things I've heard consistently, though, about him. You get paid well, and you got time off, as far as the wrestlers go. Uh -huh. um, so, well, I was what only, about work? Go I was ahead. part timer with him, so he did pay yeah. well. Um, and I was on the first episodes um, for almost a year of his ESPN show, for as long it was, as it was in Atlantic City before they relocated to Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, because I was teaching school. I was, I'm an educator by trade. Wow. So I wasn't available to travel out midweek to, uh, yeah. to Las Vegas. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I had, um, he was a little distant sometimes, but yeah, he, he, you know, his persona to me was like a politician. He would always arrive like dressed very Natalie, you know, and very like scrubbed and always with the hand out and the shake and the big smile. And the, that, that was the Vern that I knew. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Polished and ready to go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But th <laughs> there are other um, uh, promoters, bookers that have gotten mixed reviews like Bill Watts, who I worked with. Yeah like Ole Anderson, who I worked with. And I never had a problem with, um, with either of them. There were very few that didn't yeah. understand what I did and didn't show appreciation for what I did. There are a couple of them, but there were very few. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go back a little bit, what you said earlier, if we could, uh, Gary, about what you did outside of the ring. You said you were an educator. So, Let's talk about that a little bit, if we could. Uh, what did you teach? Uh, you know, obviously you went to college if you were an educator. So can we talk a little bit about that, your childhood growing up and getting into the in, in educating business? Sure. Well, I was, uh, I grew up in New Jersey and um, went to college in New Jersey. And um, I taught secondary education. So it's seven through grades, seven through 12, mostly in the, uh, high school. Um, most of my years and, and as time went on, I was in and out because I left in 80, 1989 when I went with WCW full time. And then after I finished my stint with WCW, they called me back and I went back into the classroom. Um, I was a Spanish teacher. Um, in the last few years, I was a, a Spanish teacher for a school called Christian Brothers Academy. It was a private all boys uh, Catholic school. And the last three years that I was there, I was, uh, I chaired the language department. Oh, wow. So uh, before, you know, then I retired. So wow. yeah, I had, I had a, I loved teaching there and they kept hiring me. They, they hired me four <laughs> different times to tell you the truth from 85 till uh, not too long ago. So wow. yeah, I had, I had a good experience with them. Great. That's, see, that's something I didn't know. I had no idea you were a, a Spanish teacher. Well, you know, uh, an educator is, is someone that communicates information. So yeah. does an announcer. Um, there are parallels. Um, when I wrote my book, which I can't believe came out 23 years ago, in 2000, yeah. the first edition, 
um, which which went on to be you know, really a successful book, yeah. along with Have a Nice Day, Mick Foley. Um, yeah. It was, we had two of the first books of the newer generation. Um, so like quite a few of the things that I did were a bit innovative, including getting back to my point, I understand that not everybody reads, not everybody is a, an avid reader, not everybody has the time to. So people educate themselves, inform themselves in different ways. You know, some people listen to books on tape, for instance. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> another first was I created the one man shows, which to for a lot of the wrestlers, it, it's really a Q&A, but I did a stage show and um, this was back in 2002, had not been done before because I understood that telling a story and showing video overhead as I'm telling the story is another way to communicate information to inform your public, which is why I did what I did. Yeah. Um, the first one we did was at, um, Christopher Newport University in Virginia, uh, George Steele, the animal was my guest. And we drew, we drew about 500 people that, cause that was new. That was kind of amazing. And then later, a uh, couple months later, I did it at the pro wrestling hall of fame induction weekend up in New York state. So, um, and it, then it wasn't until, uh, it was like 2017 or so that I brought it back out on the, on the road, but it was a full two hour stage show. It was loosely scripted. There is interaction with the crowd, but, um, but you know, it was a real like stage show. It, it wasn't just, I'm mean, answering uh, like Q, it's not a Q and A, although I had a Q and A at the end of the show. Yeah. So I had a lot of fun with that. I, I brought that back out. Oh man, I went as far, I don't know, my base was Jersey. I brought it as far west as Chicago and oh, wow. Louisville and Indianapolis and as far north as um, Massachusetts and as far south as Tampa, um, Orlando. So yeah, I had, so as an educator, it was another way of informing. That was my whole point. Did you ever wonder what could have been with the AWA had things gone differently? Had their fortunes gone differently? Had certain wrestlers not left and perhaps more money would have been at the disposal of the Ganyas? Well, wonder no further. You can go to Brad Drake's YouTube channel and experience the 1987 Supermod for yourself. As Brad Drake starts off in May 1987, along with Greg Ganya, Baron Von Rotschke, Vern Ganya himself, Nick Bockwinkle, Larry Zabisco, Kurt Hennig, and a slew of others as he plays and saves the AWA. So you're an innovator. Uh, it's really quite interesting. You know, I didn't know this stuff, and I'll be and I'll and I'll full disclosure to our fans that I told you this. Earlier, I, I didn't know you had a book out, which is kind of embarrassing for me because I'm pretty <laughs> active as a pro wrestling fan. That you didn't have a book until the other day when I was researching it. I have ordered it though. I was teasing uh, you about it, but you know that yeah. <laughs> it's not a necessarily bad thing because because this book just keeps on selling. It's you know it's well it's it's been with the current publisher since uh, two thousand six, and so, I don't yeah. think they keep it on their active list if it wasn't. And I know right. that you, know, you keep selling. It's yeah. it's the number one seller when I go out and do conventions. Oh yeah. Well, I can imagine. I mean, it's, it, it, I've read the reviews on it. It's it, I, like I said, I'm, I'm going to read it. It, it sounds like a great book. So I'm excited to get it. It was a lot of fun. Well, it, 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 yeah. It, you know, when I finished WCW, so by that time I had 21 years in uh, pro wrestling and um, it was difficult to one day you're full time, and then the next day you've retired from that part of your career. So to let go is very difficult. And this, and that was a therapeutic little exercise of like letting go little by little by little by sharing 
20 at that time, 21 years of uh, experiences and memories. And I mean, I, I didn't really expect it to turn into a book. Mm. It was just a little therapy, you know, therapy that I set up for myself. Yeah. But um, two years I sat home and every day over those two years, didn't go to any other kind of job. I, I either wrote or edited every day and I loved it. It was, yeah, it was great. <clears throat> wow. It does take up quite a while to write a book. Uh, Cause you, you know, you got to edit it, like you said, write it. And, and sometimes you got to do research on yourself even, you know, like, did I do that? Can I, what else did I do? Things like that. So I'm sure it was yeah, therapeutic and, and, and challenging. Once you, once you realize that, okay, this is heading towards a book. Now you have to start thinking about how do I get it out there? It, you yeah. know, 23 years ago, it wasn't as easy as it is today to put content online. Um, mm -hmm. Online in the nineties was in its infancy. So I went yeah. the old school route of getting an agent to seek out a publisher. And yeah, that, that, that took up a bunch of time too. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. <clears throat> wow. Hey everyone. This is Brian Ferguson. Fans of the AWA, you are in for a real treat. My friend Joyce Postion has just released her book titled My Ringside Seat to the AWA. Joyce writes about her personal experiences with wrestlers such as Nick Bockwinkle, Lord Alfred Hayes, Baron Von Raschke, and others. Joyce also has published many photos from her collection that you will not see anywhere else. Order today by email at joyce.poshin at gmail.com. Payment is through PayPal. The book is only $20 plus $6 shipping and handling. International orders, please email Joyce for shipping charms. Folks, run. Don't walk to your keyboard and order today. And enjoy the podcast. So... If we could go back a little bit further. So growing up, Gary, what your childhood, if you could tell us a little bit about that, your, your, your family, and then how you got interested in wrestling. I mean, was there somebody in your family that started watching it and you watch it with them or how did that come about? That's the use. That's the normal way. Um, one of the first things I do at my stage show is I ask the audience how did you find wrestling? Exactly what you're asking me. And nine times out of 10, they were introduced by someone in their family, could be a grandparent or a parent, or it was a friend. It was somebody usually that was important in their lives. <clears throat> and I think that's why pro wrestling stays near and dear to their hearts is because their formative years and growing up are tied into pro wrestling for me it was a little different for me i um i was just flipping the channels late one night and came across this um <clears throat> i didn't know what it was this exhibition i, I didn't think i was old enough to be watching this because it was <laughs> think about what it be back then and today you know it's 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 really prettied up today but back then it was kind of drab. It was just a darkened uh, space with a, a light in the center and two scantily dressed men that are sweating and that are throwing each other around. And it's like, like, what is this? <laughs> and like, I, I just, I thought it was something I shouldn't be watching. Um, and, and then I was in fifth, sixth grade. So this, just to give you an idea of like where my, my you know i didn't i didn't know and um the next week when i when i found it again before, um there were women in bathing suits this was wow this is what my 11 year old brain is 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 processing there are women in and they're doing the same thing and there are people that looked kind of normal sitting around and they're hooting and they're hollering and and then when I saw the midgets, it was like, wow, this is really cool. So I, because back then you didn't admit at school that you were a wrestling fan. It was like, you were, you were a closet fan or you were yeah. made fun of as yeah. opposed to a baseball or basketball or football fan. So, um, 
but yeah, that's how I found it. Wow. <laughs> I understand that wrestling fan, the closet. I was like that until probably, oh gosh, 84, 85, when it went pretty much mainstream, when, uh, then it was, then it was cool. And then all my friends were like, aren't you a wrestling fan? I was like, yeah, I am. But you know, I didn't really want to say anything before. So I, I get it. I understand that. And now look at your room. <laughs> and now look at my room. Yeah, You can't get away from it. <laughs> this is the only room I'm allowed to have decorated like this. My wife, <laughs> I get one space. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're lucky that you have the one, you know? I uh, know, right? Some guys uh, don't even get the one. No, they don't. <laughs> oh, all right. So if we could, Gary, uh, remembering your first match, being in that ring, what was that like for you? Mm, that was surreal. Um, because I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, the very first time I... Stepped into the ring. Mm -hmm. Very the first time. Okay. The first challenge was how to get into a ring. <laughs> I, it's, it's not as simple as it looks the first time you do it. Like I would never, nor should a ring announcer ever vault over the top rope. And I'm okay. not going to like roll in under the bottom rope. That would be <laughs> not appropriate. So now what do you do? Like if you have never negotiated that before and there are 1500 1800 people watching you try to figure out whether to go through the top two ropes or the bottom two ropes it's so that was uh embarrassing because right there and then they knew i didn't have a clue the fans knew <laughs> um and that was uh, turned out to be a good thing because um it it brought it, it made me like a regular guy and it gave yeah. me, it gave them another target to, uh, you know, another person to harass. Uh, and they did. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, the first match that I introduced, um, and the first person that I introduced was a guy by the name of Pretty Boy Larry Sharp, who yeah. created the Monster Factory um, in New Jersey. The, the wrestling training school back when there were very few of them. Mm -hmm. And it was his first match. So our careers began at the same time. It was, wow. I think it was July 6th, 1974. So in introducing him at for his first match, first time I'm ever in the ring. So that was interesting. And the main event, had my childhood hero, Bruno San Martino. So ah. you can imagine, I was, it was uh, San Martino versus Nikolai Volkov. This was at, in Wildwood, New Jersey at the convention hall. Wow. So yeah, I was uh, really nervous. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm now I'm standing, not only am I standing just feet away from my childhood hero, but I'm introducing him and uh -huh. it's a very public, spectacle so it was, it was and i was never allowed in the locker room so i had no interaction with any of the wrestlers um outside of the ring for about a year and a half two years wow but that's how long wow. it, it took for them to trust me yeah back then uh kayfabe <clears throat> excuse me was pretty solid they didn't give away nothing um so let's kind of talk about that if we could a little bit. So you, you were in the business for quite a few years. Transitioning, going from, you know, a weekly TV show at a TV studio to the, you know, the big arenas, you know, on Nitro and, and, and uh, where if you were on Raw, things like that. Uh, what was that like for you? I mean, seeing that huge transition, like from the eighties going into the nineties, that transformation of weekly television when you're a ring announcer, that had to be kind of mind boggling or mind something. Well, I started, um, I started 
um, announcing for the weekly TV show, um, WWF at the time, only two years into announcing. Mm -hmm. So um, you, that you know that came early on, and once I was on weekly television, then I started at the larger arenas that were local to me. So there were two of them. There was the Meadowlands and the Philadelphia Spectrum. Um, so it, it all was like pretty gradual and, um, I can't say like they made a huge impact. It, you know, obviously it's always, um, it, it more exciting, you know, when there are, are tens of thousands of people that are present. But by the time I did that, I had, um, I had been doing local venues for two years. So I pretty much knew what I was doing. It actually, it took me seven years before I felt like I hit my stride, but it was all very gradual. Um, and then um, when I was with WCW and we traveled um, through Canada and Europe, um, that, was, that was very cool because you can be doing the TV and not really appreciating or realizing that what you're doing is being viewed by people all over the world. So yeah. that when you're in Europe and people are recognizing you, um, I mean, that, that really hits you the first time that happens. That's yeah. pretty, uh, pretty neat. Even though, even, even though you know that it's being broadcast around the world, until you experience the recognition by the folks in the different countries, uh, yeah. it doesn't have the same impact. Yeah. No, oh, I... I can imagine wrestling fans, promoters, wrestlers, and anyone who enjoys pro wrestling now have something new to be excited about. The Wrestling Fans International Association, the WFIA, is back. WFIA is an association that exists to promote, grow, and support professional wrestling throughout the world. Membership is free. Your membership includes a free digital bi-monthly publication of the Wrestling Fan News newsletter, association updates, voting privileges, and much more. Please go to thewfia.org, that's T-H-E-W-F-I-A.org, and become a member today. So when you went full-time with uh, WCW traveling, what was that like on your uh, family life, your personal life? Was it was it challenging? Was it, uh, it's okay, you know, I, I'll, you know, what was that like i like well i love the life so i love traveling i really like mm -hmm. i'm a i love driving mm -hmm. um but i when i entered um wcw i put in some uh, and i got them to agree to and i represented myself in the beginning mm -hmm. um certain provisions that i felt needed to be in order for me to remain sane and one of those was, um, see, they would cover your expenses if you traveled three to a, a car. So if, if there were three wrestlers or more in a car, they would um, cover your rental car. Okay. And they flew everybody around. So, you, you know, that, but I also had built in um, employee perks as opposed to, um, independent contractor so they also paid for my food on the road they paid for um they pay i i was out of that three person will cover you i was able to travel alone mm -hmm. i i knew that i i couldn't just, i knew my personality and there was no way that i was going to be able to survive being in a closed space with the same people every single day and I also feared I'd wind up being like um, a gopher and dropping guys off at the gym. And it's like, no, 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 no. I, I enjoyed traveling with wrestlers, but when I wanted that to happen, and then I would right. share my benefits with them because um, they took care of um, everything. They, you know, they flew everyone around. They took care of my hotel. I had a food stipend. Even uh, parking at the airport, they took care of. They took oh, wow. care of uh, uh, ground transportation, like to 
for someone to drive me from home to the airport um, and then back at the end of the trip. So I had employee benefits and performers money. So that was, that was sweet. That was yeah. real sweet. Um, so I, you know, I had the best of all possible scenarios yeah. and, uh, and I, and I liked the life. So, um, ordinarily, um, a wrestler will sleep in the city where they've just wrestled. My way was a little different. I like to travel through the night. So okay. at the end of a show, I'd hop in the car and drive four or five hours to the next city. Um, and then they were more liberal with hotel rooms and when you can check out and when you had to check, you know, when you could check in, when you had to check out. So uh, you can get like a late checkout or an early check in. It, you know, the airports were easy to get in and out of um, because it was before the security that they have today. Yeah. I, the, the folks that travel today, I mean, they, they must spend 60% of their day in an airport. It's, uh, you know, we used to be able to pull up to an airport less than an hour before flight time, drop off the rental car and make our way down to the gate and, and have plenty of time left over. We yeah. obviously can't do that today. No, so I loved the life. It was great, but I had all the benefits for it. Wow. That sounds like, yeah, sounds like you got a good deal. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I, I was just fortunate. You know? Yeah. No, that's interesting. So we could talk a little bit, Gary, about uh, wrestlers that you worked with. Later on, obviously, you said it took two years for you to kind of get into people trusting you in the locker room and things. Who was one of your favorite people wrestling wrestler wise that you really enjoyed working with? You know, you, you just put a smile on your face or, or made you feel good, something like that. Well, that would have to be Gorilla Monsoon. Yeah. Um, He's, he, at the time that I started in 1974, I didn't know it at the time, but he was a, a co-owner of the WWF. And he was the person that um, called me to bring me in on a regular basis. And he also was the producer of their TV show. And he called me in and put me on television. And he and I uh, became uh, very close. You know, I would spend time at his at his house. He also lived in uh, New Jersey. He had a he had a pool table in his um, basement. You know, where um, he would have you know guys over and just to socialize, to hang out. Um, he uh, he showed concern about me um, personally. Mm -hmm. So he, he was like a, like a big brother to me in those yeah. early years. Wow. Gorilla Monsoon. Yeah. A lot of people loved him and respected him. I know Bobby the Brain Heenan absolutely adored him. He thought he was one of the greats. I'm looking forward to, um, there's a, a biography coming out in the spring on Gorilla Monsoon. So yes. I, I interviewed yeah. for it. So I'm looking forward to it. Oh yeah, Brian R. Solomon, right? I believe yes. he was writing the book. Yeah, yeah. I saw that online. It looks, yeah. He's a good writer too, so I know it'll be a good book. He's a very he good writer. Publisher. Okay, yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's great. So, promotion wise, I know you're mainly on the East Coast for quite a while. Is that correct? Is that what I'm assuming most of your time? The, um, yeah, the, the territory time. Yes. The territory time. What was one of your favorite promotions during that time that you just enjoyed there working for? One. There, was, there was only one promotion. It was just WWF. You know, it was, um, okay. in that remember once again, I was, um, I was in the classroom every morning. Yep. Didn't yep. matter where I announced the night before. Because uh, we would do our TV shows on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights, and that right. was that was about three hours from where I lived. 
So right after school, I'd hop in the car and make it to the, that show and you finish at 11 and another three hours back home and, you know, two or three hours sleep and in the classroom in the morning. So um, I didn't have a whole lot of socializing time with other people in the sport right. um, because I never skipped school to, um, I, maybe I wasn't like hundred percent there mentally, but I, I always <laughs> knew that. I used to buy to keep me awake, like, cause remember I, I'm up at six o'clock in the morning to, you know, to, to be in the classroom and driving home late at night, like two in the morning or so I would, there were these, um, all night Howard Johnson's and Howard Johnson's was known for, I think it was 39 varieties of ice cream. So I would stop and pick up a pint of ice cream and I would eat it like not with a spoon, but just out of the container <laughs> so that it would like go up my nose and on my face and that would keep me awake for the, like the yeah. last leg of my, of my trip home. Um, wow. Yeah. But I mean, you have to really love what you're doing in order to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you do. It sounds like it. <laughs> so nowadays, you know, you wrote your book in, in 2000. Uh, you've done a lot of conventions. Uh, you're on social media. I see these uh, amazing photos and uh, posters from the territory era that when you were working there. Uh, what is that like when you get that stuff out and you're going to put something on social media, bringing back memories for you? Does it like sometimes make you feel like, gosh, I wish I could still wish I wish somebody call me and do some announcing or do you do some announcing or I do. what's going on I with do. it? I do. Okay. Um, I was, I was at a, a couple times this summer. In fact, okay. uh, your neck of the woods, um, a, a year and a half ago, I was actually in, uh, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, but this summer I was in St. Paul, um, for uh, Midwest all-star wrestling. Um, they had a little convention. They inducted Nikita Koloff and Ken Patera yeah. and Eddie Sharkey into the Minnesota pro wrestling hall of fame, which I didn't know existed. And then that night I introduced the main event. Okay. Um, and then I was out in Tampa earlier in the summer. Um, yeah. And this just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Pennsylvania and New York city. So yeah, either, either conventions or, um, guest announcing, I still get out, um, yeah. a dozen times a year. All right. So last question here, what are you got any upcoming events coming up here? Yeah. Next few um, weeks? No, I'm. Uh, I just finished. Probably what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the year. Okay. Um, you, you never know. You know, I, I I get calls all the time. Yeah. Um. The to answer your question about like the memorabilia. Like I have stuff here. Like this is a this is a Pro Wrestling Illustrated from uh, I think it was 2001. January 2001. So I moved, uh, I relocated to Florida the beginning of this year. Oh. So I went through everything and organized everything and cataloged. And I'm still putting um, tapes. Wow. These are, you know, uh, VHS tapes on uh, digital. Yeah. So this is taking forever. These, this happens to be uh, AWA from Atlantic City. Wow. Um, so my point being, um, and this the the significance of this Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine, it's the first and uh, I think only time that a um, a book was excerpted in a magazine like this. Oh yeah, there it is. I see it. Yeah. Body slams. Yeah. So, uh, this was the awesome. uh, scissor fight in, in, uh, England. 
Um, yeah, so I've been through and I keep going through all of these, uh, you know, my collectibles and, and I bring some of the collectibles with me when I do conventions. Mm -hmm. um, I had WCW pay-per-view posters with me the last time um, I was out. So, yeah, so I, I, I had to go through everything in catalog. It was my point yeah. because I recently moved. So okay. it's as organized as it's probably ever going to get. <laughs> this is um, this is the program from that 2002 um, Body Slams stage show. Oh, so wow! Cool. Yeah, Gaines Theater, Christopher Newport University. Wow! Yeah. All kinds of things like that. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm glad you're so active on social media, too, because I love seeing your posts about, you know, when you have those posters up or you have a photo or, you know, things like that. It just brings back so many uh, memories for me and I know for a lot of fans out there. Uh, it's great. We love it. Uh, you know, you're one of the ring announcers that really, honestly, uh, for my generation – really can remember uh you know ring announcers are, are, are you know a key component but you just had that it factor i think because if i say gary capetta they're going to know who i'm talking about if they're a wrestling fan thank you i appreciate that yeah no it's 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 been such an honor uh folks one more time mr gary michael capetta if you haven't got his book body slams memoirs of a wrestling pitch man Get it. I'm embarrassed to say I don't have it yet, and I'm getting it. <laughs> and they can find me on um, Facebook at my initials, GMC number four real. Um, okay. GMC for real, and then simply Gary Capetta on Twitter X. Right, X now, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Yeah, I'll have that all that information about his book, his social media, and the description. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Gary Michael Capetta, sir. Thank you for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. I, um, I I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, folks. If you're watching, thank you. If you're listening, thank you. If you haven't subscribed, please do so, and we will talk to you soon.